Good morning, Sela City Church. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Here we go. The Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, and all the earth rejoices. Higher, higher, your name be glorified. The Lord reigns, the Lord reigns. Creation, lift your voices louder, louder. Your praise be amplified.
up our praise to you, Jesus, because you are holy, holy, holy. Hallelujah.
just want you, we just want you. We just want you, we just want you. We just want you, we just want you. Nobody else will do. We just want you, we just want you. We just want you, we just want you. We just want you, we just want you. Oh, nobody else will do. We want more of you, Jesus. We just want you, we just want you. Oh, we just want you, we just want you. We just want you, we just want you. Nobody else will do. Come on, if you want more of him, just tell him we want more. We just want you. Just being with you is enough, Lord. Is he enough? Is he enough for us? Or are we looking for more? Another element. More lighting. More presentation. More production. Or is he enough? Just want to be with you, Jesus. On this Palm Sunday where the multitudes gathered and they began to cry out, Hosanna, and to worship you and to recognize you as the Messiah. God, we, we do the same today. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with worship. We welcome you, God, with our songs. Can you join me right now with uplifted hands and in a loud voice, just begin to praise him because he is enough. As a matter of fact, he is more than enough. Hallelujah. Let there be praise in the house of the Lord today. Let there be full hearts of worship. Lives that are full of his presence. That are content. That are content in him. We love you. We love you. Jesus. Before we continue with the service, come on, I want everybody with a hallelujah in your mouth, with a hosanna in your, if you're a child of God, you know what we need to do right now. You don't need me to tell you, you know, you know, you know. Let it go, let it flow. We've gathered into the house of God.
not to just see ourselves, but to have an encounter with the Almighty God. As the musicians continue to play, come on. Let's just worship Him. Father, thank you for your presence. If we did nothing else all day long, God, we'd be content with just being in your presence, God. I pray today in this service, God, that you would make yourself real to many people. That you would speak to hearts, Holy Spirit that you would break down walls and barriers and remove distractions and help us to see you, to hear from you through the worship, through a greeting, through your word, God. We commit it all into your hands, Holy Spirit. Give us all an unction. 
that we might honor you and love you, that we might honor and love one another today, God. Help us. We give you this service, Lord. We give you the glory, honor, and praise. We pray this in your blessed name. And the entire church says with me, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, God. King of glory. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Selah City Church, our 10 o'clock English service. Isn't the presence of God sweet? Isn't it sweet sometimes? It's just like God is just ministering and, and touching and encouraging. I don't know about you, but I need, I need more of that, more of that in my life. Welcome. So glad to have the gathering of the body of Christ here, uh, in both in person and online. What a joy to be in the house of the Lord together. And before we greet one another, I, I know we may have a couple of people that may be visiting for the first time. And if you're online, welcome. Thank you for uh, being online, Facebook, YouTube. And if it's your first time, put hashtag visitor in the comment section. Our moderator would love to greet you and get you connected. And if you're in the room for the first time, so glad to have you. Uh, so glad that you're here on this beautiful Palm Sunday uh, today. And uh, I'd love to give, be able to say hello if I can get, get around to everybody. Uh, but uh, if you're visiting for the first time, do me a favor. On your chair, there's a connect card. Uh, if you can do that. Or I, I don't know if we'll have the QR code on the screen or or, or whatever we got to do. But would love to connect with you on your chair. Uh, there's the, uh, the card. Fill it out. Drop it off at guest services. And uh, we would love, love to connect with you today. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, before we get into the announcements and some other things, uh, I love this time. This is where I get to say hello to everybody, kind of meet and greet. So I need you to do the same. So let's take a few minutes right now, walk around, two or three people, gather, uh, greet them, hug one another, love one another, and we'll be right back.
right here. Come on, wave your palms at me right now. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless you, each and every one of you. Welcome to our 10 a.m. service. Those of you online, I saw you waving your palms. My name is Andy Maldonado. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and I want to give you a few announcements and an offering thought. So let's go to the announcements. First of all, this Wednesday is our Sailor Wednesday. So what does that mean? Two things. It means you pray with your family, and also you get prepared for Good Friday, which is coming up. Uh, that service, we're going to be here in person Good Friday, and that service starts at 7.30 p.m., and I believe that's a bilingual service, right? Okay, so Spanish, Espanol, come at 7.30 on Friday. Now, also on Sunday, and everybody knows that next Sunday is Easter, Easter, so come and celebrate with us. The, the, the one thing that makes us different from other religions. Our God rose from the dead and is alive today. And we have to celebrate that. So it's a great time to invite someone to come with you. You know, around this time of year, people are kind of thinking spiritually a bit. Great time to have them come and experience the presence of the Lord here. Our services on Easter Sunday will be at 10 a.m. in English. And then... Note this special time for Spanish, 12.30, 12 y media on Easter Sunday. Amen, you got those? If you tend to forget things, we have a little card on your chair that you can put up to maybe some of the places that you visit often, like in my case, the refrigerator, you know? And it'll remind you of all of our service times. I want to give you a little thought. Just a little thought on our offering. And before I give you the thought, I just want you to know that there are three ways to give here at the church. Okay, we're going to post them up on the board uh, and so you can check those out. But, you know, we're going to, this is called tithes and offerings. And, and I just started thinking the other day about the word tithe and where it comes from. And I got directed to a verse that really struck me, and that is in Genesis 14, verses 18 to 19. Study this when you get home, because it will enrich your understanding of tithing. It says, Melchizedek, the king of Salem and a priest of God most high, brought Abram some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abram with his blessing. Blessed be Abram by God, most high, creator of heaven and earth. So if you're, the story takes place right after a major victory for Abram. And he meets Melchizedek, who is also known as the king of Salem, which stands for peace. And, and Melchizedek blesses him in the name of the Lord, because he was also a high priest of, of the Lord God, most high. So the story right now kind of is, is interesting, and we're all going, oh, he got blessed by Melchizedek. But it's the next verse, which I haven't read, which is really the crux of my thought. You see, because the next verse, Abram takes a tenth of all that he had gathered, and he gave it to Melchizedek as an offering. Two things I want you to know about that. This tithe is... The first, in the Bible, when you get first anything, that sets the principle in motion. This was the first time anybody gave a tithe. As a matter of fact, the word tithe does not appear any time before this. Here's the interesting part. The law hadn't been given yet. So there was no sense of tithing as we know it. So what did Abraham do? He offered to Melchizedek and enhanced the, to the Lord, thanking him for the blessing. Let me give you a whole revolutionary thought about tithing. 
Tithing isn't to get something from God. It isn't even your duty before God. It is your gratitude for what God has already done in your life. And come on, if you're with me today. No, I ain't going to preach. It's gratitude. So my tithe this morning is a thank you to God for all he has already done in my life. And God promises that he will then continue to bless you. Let's pray together. Father God, God, what a perfect, perfect time in the year to say thank you. Lord, we probably have more than we deserve. I know I do. So I thank you for all that you have provided in my life. And Lord, let my tithe and my offering speak of my worship of your name. For Lord, you promised to meet every one of our needs. And that includes the church's needs. So Lord, take this tithe and multiply it for your glory and for your honor. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen and amen. God bless you as you give.
redemption is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. Come on, sing that again. We ain't done. Jesus, yes, Lord. Our redemption, our redemption, our salvation. Yeah, is in His blood. Jesus, light of heaven. Jesus, hey, light of heaven. Friend forever, friend forever. His kingdom come. the hand right now. Come on, join hands. Father, we thank you for our time together as the body of Christ. And I pray even now as we enter into this time in your word, God, we we don't necessarily want to, we have to hear from you. We need to hear from you. So, Holy Spirit, I pray that you take my words, God, and just somehow use them, Lord. Give everyone here what they they need. Fresh manna from heaven. Different situations, different circumstances, different needs. Some need healing today. Some need encouragement. Some are going through something painful today. Lord, you know each and every one of our lives. Some are confused. Some need direction, God. We all need something. So I pray you would provide what we need. Maybe it's extra strength. Maybe it's grace. Maybe it's more patience. Maybe it's revelation. Maybe it's inspiration. Whatever it is, we depend on you, Lord. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together, everybody. Thank you, singers. Thank you, worship team. Brothers and sisters, I want you to take out your Bibles, and I want to share something with you on this beautiful Palm Sunday day. I want to share today what I've titled, You Missed It. You missed, thank you for that, oh geez, here we go. You missed it. Does anybody here remember back in the day, who remembers Blockbuster? Who still has a video from Blockbuster that's overdue? (laughs) Tell the truth. Come on, you got that thing. You didn't even rewind it. It's just sitting there. The days of the video store, Blockbuster. Some of you Gen Z, Gen A, You got to go Google it, okay? Google it, and you'll find all about Blockbuster was a store. You go in there, you rent your videos, and they ruled the day. They, they, They were an amazing store. You could get your video games there. You could get your movies there, a whole bunch of things. Um, You could even get your popcorn there. Like, it was like all one-stop shopping. Well, did you know that many years ago that Netflix offered Blockbuster 
with a chance to buy Netflix for $50, $50 million. But Blockbuster didn't think that Netflix was going anywhere. They said, because oh, remember, if you remember initially, Netflix was mail order. I don't know if you guys, you know, you'd, you'd do everything by mail order. You'd rent a game. You'd send it in the mail. They'd send it back. That was their beginnings. And so Blockbuster said, nah, that's not going anywhere. And so they turned down the offer uh, because they couldn't see it. And it wound, winds up being a missed opportunity. They, they missed it. Blockbuster, of course, winds up filing for bankruptcy. They go under. And Netflix is probably valued at, I don't know, $140 billion. What a missed opportunity. Have you had a, ever had a missed opportunity? I pray it wasn't a billion-dollar opportunity. because, well, <laughs> But I'm sure we've all had missed opportunities. And the thing with missed opportunities, there's two things. One, sometimes missed opportunities don't come back around again. You get that one shot, that one window, and then it's gone. That's, the, that's one thing about missed opportunities. The other opportunity, the other thing about missed opportunities is that sometimes when you miss those opportunities, they bring unfortunate consequences. Things that you didn't really want to have to deal with, but because of the decision you made and you missed it, there were now consequences. This happens, I think, all the time, both in the natural with decisions that we make, the way we live our lives, doors that open, doors that close. But it also happens a lot with our walk with God. I think about my life, and I, and I wonder how many missed opportunities were there. How many doors did God open that I did not walk through because maybe I didn't have enough faith or didn't think it was God and made a bad decision? I'm sure we've all been there, both in the natural and in our, in our walk with God. And today I want to take the Palm story, the Palm Sunday story. If you don't know it, I'll tell it to you briefly. What Palm Sunday is all about, its importance, its significance. But I want to take this story and I want to, I want to I want to talk about two things in this story that I think can cause some of us today to miss some opportunities with God. We know there were missed opportunities back then, and I think these lessons are so important for us today because we face a lot of the same things, especially with these two things that I'm going to say to you today. And this is important, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, because although God is the God of the second and third and fourth and fifth chance, it's not always the case that we get that opportunity. And honestly, sometimes even in the kingdom of God, when we miss opportunities, there are consequences that we suffer that were not really meant for us. So, so I want you to pay attention. Now, as we look at the, the story in the Bible of Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem for the last time in his life. Luke 19, I'm reading from verse 35 to 40, and if you know the story, you know Jesus understands that his time has come, and he's going to walk into, he's going to parade into Jerusalem, and he tells his disciples to get him the donkey. Jesus sits on the donkey, and he's going to march, you know, just waltz right into Jerusalem, the city of God. And it says this in verse 35. They brought it to Jesus, being the donkey. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, uh, really, what uh, the translation there is, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest were some of the key phrases that were being yelled out on that day. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, 
the stones will cry out. To give you a little bit of context, Jesus has recently just raised Lazarus from the dead. A tremendous miracle, one of his, one of his greater miracles that people witnessed when his friend Lazarus died and Jesus shows up at the tomb of Lazarus and says, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus rises from the dead. So Jesus' fame is at an all-time high. There's a lot of hype. There's a lot of uh, enthusiasm surrounding who Jesus was. And so here he is, Jesus knowing this is his last week on earth. Sunday, Palm Sunday, he will be crucified and will rise again all in one week. But today is the beginning of that week, his last week on earth. And he's heading to Jerusalem with a purpose. And the purpose is basically, in a nutshell, to publicly declare to everyone that he was the Messiah, the, pe the one that the people of God, that the Israelites had longed for, had been praying for, had been waiting on. He was publicly declaring that I am he who you've been waiting for. And people, uh, because of what Jesus had already done and because of who he was saying that he was, people begin to worship him. The disciples, his followers, there was a multitude that formed even before walking into the city, according to Luke. And the people are worshiping. There's joy. There's excitement. There's a spirit of celebration. Uh, the, the, the whole idea of blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and Hosanna in the highest comes from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is a messianic psalm, meaning it's a psalm uh, foretelling of the coming Messiah. And, and these were the very words that were said in Psalm 18. And so here the people are recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah. They're quoting Psalm 118 in the presence of Jesus. And everyone's excited. Everyone's pumped up. Here it is. The one that we've been waiting for has finally arrived. We're marching our way into Jerusalem. This is, this is it, guys. This is our big day, our big moment. Let's go. So there's a big, big um, uh, amount of excitement and joy. But then there's a moment in Luke 19, and they're, they're not even in the city yet. They're just walking in. But upon, just before walking in, I, I want you to read the following verses because it's so crucial to what I'm going to say to you today. They're found further down. The next verses, I read to 40. Now look at 41 to 44. As he approached Jerusalem, meaning Jesus, and saw the city, he wept over it. He begins to cry over the city. I've been twice. I've been to Jerusalem, to, to Israel twice, and both times I've stood on the Mount of Olives, looking out where you can see the entire city. And Jesus sees the city, and he begins to cry. He begins to weep for the people. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. But here's what he said. If you, speaking to the city, if you, even you, Jerusalem people of God, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground. You and the children within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. It must have been somewhat of an awkward moment there. The people are rejoicing. The people are celebrating. And they're all excited and happy. And Jesus begins to cry. And maybe the people are saying, oh, look, he's crying tears of joy. But no, they're tears of anguish and sadness. And then he goes on to declare this. And I can imagine the people really didn't understand or didn't comprehend what he was talking about because they're seeing the multitude around him celebrating him, worshiping him. It didn't, probably didn't even make sense to them in that moment. If you only knew what would bring you peace. And he begins to describe a future event that I'll tell you about in just a few minutes. And he said, they'll leave no stone unturned here because you did not recognize the time of, other versions say, the time of God's visitation to you. 
In other words, when God came down to earth and you did not even realize it. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem saying they didn't know what would even bring them peace. They didn't know God was, was in their midst. They were, they were missing it. They were missing the moment. They were missing the opportunity. They were missing what was happening. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, have you ever missed it with God? Have you ever had a tremendous opportunity come before you and because of some, some lack of faith or fear or anxiety or worry that something just happened and you felt like you got bypassed, you didn't execute, you didn't move forward, you didn't take the step, and all of a sudden you're, you're feeling, having these feelings, you're feeling some type of way like, man, I, I, I think I missed it. I think God wanted to do something. God told me to speak to this person. God told me to say something, and I just couldn't find it in me to do it. I think we've all been there in one way or another, in one context or another. We know what it's like to miss God, to know that he exists, to know that he's real, to know that he's with us, that he is my God, even my Savior, but yet I've missed it. In spite of knowing all these things, that he's real. I made a decision and I missed out on something. In the book of Matthew, when he tells the same story, this story is found in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in Matthew's account, he also adds uh, the, the whole idea of the, the, the fig tree being cursed by Jesus. I believe Matthew references it as the following day, which was a picture. It was a fig tree. Jesus was hungry. He's looking for fruit on the tree. There's no fruit on the tree, and Jesus curses the fig. And it's a picture of when we study, the, the, when we analyze the, what, what happened there, it's a picture of Israel as a nation being found fruitless. Jesus came looking for fruit, and there was none. It's not the only place where Jesus had spoken about this. Earlier in Luke 13, verse 34 and 35, Jesus even even, uh, foretold of this one day happening. Uh, In Luke 13, 34 and 35, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord foretelling of this moment where Jesus would show up again in Jerusalem and this was being publicly declared about him. So a very powerful story. And let me, let's talk about two things that I think are key here with regards to what we just read. There's two questions. The first question is, what were they missing? What were they missing? What is Jesus talking about? Why is he so upset? Why is he so sad? What did the nation of Israel miss that God wanted them to see? The second question is, why were they missing? Why? And these two questions are the very same questions that we need to ask ourselves today in our walk with God, in our lives, in our situations. Am I, am I missing? What am I missing? What have I missed? And why? Why did I miss it? Let's look at the first one. It's a little simpler and a little more obvious. What were they missing? What, why was Jesus so upset? In a nutshell, Jesus is basically saying, guys, after three years of ministry here with you guys, have I not proven to you with miracle after miracle, sign after sign, uh, prophecy after prophecy, have I not proven myself to you that I am who I say I am? And yet still you, you will not recognize who I really am. That, that the Son of God... Heaven has come down to earth. The Son of God is actually in your midst, face to face, and yet you don't see it. 
And mind you, Jesus was trying to be as clear as possible. Jesus was fulfilling prophecy to make it clear to everyone that there was no doubt what he was saying. Why do I say that? Well, because even the very fact that he got on a donkey to ride into Jerusalem this way, being called, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and Hosanna in the highest. This is all found in, 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 the, in the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 9. Look how specific this was. Uh, rejoice greatly. You have it there on your screen. Verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. King, your Messiah comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And Jesus knew this, and he's saying, I'm doing that. And, 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 and any Israelite that knew the scriptures, knew about these, the, knew about the, 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 the prophecies and what was being foretold and what they were waiting on, so Jesus is being overt. He's saying, yeah, guys, <laughs> I'm doing that. And here's the thing. Not only did they not really recognize him. And you say, Pastor, but wait, they were recognizing him. They were, Yes, yeah, some of his disciples and followers were, but as a nation, as a whole. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. Because there was a greater issue at hand. So not only did they not recognize him, by the way, but by the end of the week, they were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. How much faith did they really have in him as the son of God? If one minute they're saying, Hosanna, next thing is like, yeah, well, he's done. Crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Sorry, I should have said spoiler alert, right? Like that's coming towards the end of the week if you don't know the story. It's, it, gets, it, gets, it gets worse, but yet it gets better. Stay tuned. Um, so, so. They not only did not recognize him, they rejected him. They rejected him. And so Jesus weeps. Not for himself. Like, I need to look what I'm going to go through. I'm going to go on the cross. Oh, my God, what am I going to do for these people? Poor me. No, 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 no. He's not weeping for himself. He's weeping for them, for the people. Because they're rejecting him. And because he knows their future. He knows what's to come. Guys, are you sure you want to do this? Is this, is this what we're going to do? Is this the decision that we're making? And it breaks the heart of God. It breaks Jesus' heart to see that people have decided to, re to not only not recognize, but to reject him. And he sees what's on the horizon for them. And the popularity of Jesus quickly wanes from a parade to being crucified on a cross like a common criminal. But before we condemn the people of God, how many of us have ever been in those shoes? And, and some of it, yes, we'll say let's pre-Christ. Let's, let's say it's, we, we've, we've all been there, right? Before I knew Jesus, this is the, these are the things that I've done, how I rejected God, how, how, I, how I cast him aside, how I paid no mind, how I paid no attention. But, but hold on. How many of us already knowing God, being full of his Holy Spirit, call him Lord and Savior, giving our lives over to him, have we not found ourselves many times in those same shoes where God says, hey, I want you to go left. <sighs> you really can't do that, God. I, I'm going to go right. Hey, hey, I, I don't want you to do that. I, I know, but you understand, God, my flesh just, is just calling me. Like we've all been there. And, and God only knows the opportunities that have passed us all by because of some of those decisions that we have all made. I won't even ask for a show of hands. I'll answer for you. We've all made those decisions. You can say, oh, well, Pastor, you don't know. Oh, I know. I know humanity. I know humanity. You may be special. Oh, you're special. Oh, you're special. But humanity is, is we're all the same. We're all on the level playing field. We have spirit and we have flesh. And we have good days and we have bad days. And we make good decisions and we make bad decisions. 
That's why, ladies and gentlemen, why we need a Savior, to save us from ourselves. So we, we know what it's like to recognize God, yet not really recognize his lordship and, and go contrary to the scriptures, go contrary to, to what he said, to the point where we're just rejecting the, the counsel or the advice or the word of God, and, and we'll be disobedient. And sometimes we do it, uh, you know, unwilling, uh, unknowingly, not aware, and sometimes we're very aware. So this is, this is the what. They missed it. Jesus was with you. In the flesh, he was, he was there with you, and you couldn't even see it. Let's look at the second question, the why. Because this will explain some of this. And it, it may explain some of our own stuff. And the way we look at things sometimes. Why were they missing it? God Almighty is in their midst. How could they not see this? Was there not opportunity after opportunity to believe? Healing after healing, miracle after miracle, feeding the the 5,000, giving sight to the blind man, healing the paralytic, calming the storm. Why were they missing it? Let me give you the, the brief version. And these are, these are some of the things I've identified. There's probably more, but some of the things that I see in this text. Why were they missing it? And one of the things I think is although they publicly or they declared Hosanna and they declared Jesus as Messiah. Yes, he's the Messiah. This is the Messiah. This is the one that we're looking for. And many of this came from genuine disciples and followers who actually believed that he was the Son of God. This is it. This is the one. There was that group. Yes, absolutely. His own disciples were there recognizing him as the Messiah. But a great, great multitude of others were looking for more than just the Messiah. They were looking for something else. What does that mean? Well, you see, it has to do with expectations. The expectations that the nation of Israel had on this quote-unquote Messiah. You see, at the end of the day, Jesus was not really the kind of king that they really wanted. Their expectation of the Messiah was a military-like, nationalistic conqueror, some extreme revolutionary who was going to come in. And at this time, they were under the hand of Rome. And so they were looking for this this soldier-type guy, this Rambo, to come in and just just deliver the nation. He was going to lead the people from the bondage, much like Moses delivered the people from Egypt. This was going to be the Messiah who was just going to free them from the oppression of the Romans. That was their box. That was their idea of Messiah the one who would come. And that's why there was a lot of hype when they were coming into Jerusalem. They're like, we're marching right into town and we're going to take back what's ours and this is what he's here for and this is what he's going to do. And they had all sorts of expectations that Jesus had no plans on fulfilling. They had this whole idea of what Messiah, Jesus, here's, here's your agenda. Here's what you're going to do. And Jesus is like, that's cute, but that's not what I'm about. That's what you think I'm about. Those are your expectations, but it's not my reality. It's not the destiny that I've prepared for you all. So a lot of the reason why they missed it is because they were looking for the Messiah to do a certain thing a certain way. That's what their expectations were. That's the way they viewed the scriptures. That's the way it was going to go down. So Jesus really wasn't the kind of king they were looking for. Much less, you know, maybe they expected Jesus to ride in on a white horse and be like, let's go. And he rides in on a donkey. And they were probably like, you know, maybe there's a sword in his, you know, hidden somewhere inside. 
you know, but this doc, you know, okay, maybe he's pretty confident. He doesn't need, you know, to, he's very secure in himself. Like, but, but the fact that, that, that Jesus went about it totally already was sending others to maybe putting some doubt. Like, wait, wait, who is this guy? This, this, is, this is not how we're going to conquer and rule. So it had to do with expectations. You see, they recognized a Messiah, not the Messiah. They recognized a Messiah of their own making. A Messiah that was made in their own image. A Messiah created to fulfill their own agenda. They took God and the Word and the Scriptures and made it fit their, their story. Their context. What they thought was their needs and the way things should go down. Ladies and gentlemen, they missed it. Because they had put God in this box that God never intended to be put in. And today, is this not the case for many of us today as Christians and even in the culture today? That we take God and we make him a Messiah of our own making. God, this is what I need you to do. This is what I need you to be. This is how I need you to, to run this. This is the agenda. Fulfill my plans. And we'll make Jesus into whatever we want him to be. Whatever ideology I have, whatever perspective I have, it could be incorrect. It could be contrary to to scripture. It could be out of, you know, we'll we'll take it out of context. We'll make, we'll, we'll, we'll mold Jesus into whatever we want him to be. That's my expectation. Oh, after all, he's, he, nothing is impossible for God, right? So, so we'll, we'll take however far-fetched our idea of life is, and we'll squeeze God. We'll, we'll force him into that mold. And Jesus said, hold up one second. It ain't about your agenda. It's about my agenda. It ain't about your kingdom. It's about my kingdom. And I am the king of my kingdom. I run this. And it's not me molding to your ideas and concepts and agendas and dreams. It's about you molding to my will. It's not about me bending to you. It's about you bending the knee to me. So it has to do with expectations. So Jesus really wasn't the kind of, oh, you ain't looking for this kind of king. You're looking for something else. And just like them, we miss it. When we make it about a Messiah of our own making. When we create a God in our minds that fits our image of what he should be. To fulfill our own agendas, our own plans. And the nation of Israel missed it. One of the reasons why they missed it was because of their expectation. And it's the same reason why you and I today miss God so many times. We make it about us and what I need God to do for me. When it's really all about his will in the kingdom. And when we don't function like that, we miss opportunities. God's saying, hey, I don't know what you're doing there, but I ain't about that. You want me to be about that, but that's, it's, you got to twist it. It's not about me fulfilling what you want. It's you, it's about you doing what I want. And here's the second thing. Not only... Was, did it have to do with expectations? But honestly, this is pretty basic. It, it, has, it had to do with surrender or the lack of surrender. You see, the people were so, as a nation, they, they weren't willing to surrender this idea. It was, it was set in their mind, this is how it's going down. As a nation, can you imagine how embedded this must have been in the culture? For them as a nation to believe this is what we want, this is what we need. This is our Messiah. And they were not willing to to surrender that concept. Yes, the disciples and some of the followers that were were around him, and uh, they could have been in the thousands, but as a nation, as a whole, they were not willing to surrender that idea. They felt that's what we needed. That's what we want. And it didn't help that the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all the different sects of the of 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 the of of Judaism that were there to protect the law, and it didn't help that they didn't want to surrender their agendas either. That they didn't they weren't open to this idea of Jesus being the Messiah. 
As a matter of fact, it threatened them. They felt threatened by Jesus. And they didn't want to surrender their agenda either because the Pharisees and unfortunately the religious leaders had an agenda in that day. And they didn't like it one bit what was going on on Palm Sunday, I can assure you that. That's why they, they, when we were just read, the Pharisees were telling Jesus, Y'all, hey, rebuke your disciples. Do you hear what they're saying? They're calling you Messiah. Rebuke your disciples. They're quoting Psalm 118 over you. And you're writing on a donkey. Who do you think you are? The leaders were not, were intimidated, were insecure. Because they knew what was going on. They knew the significance. They knew Psalm 118. They knew what Jesus was doing. They knew what the people, how they were responding, what this was all meaning. And they were having none of it. We're not surrendering. You remember in those days, the, 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 the Pharisees, just, they, all, they ruled. They had the power. They had the position. They had the money. As a matter of fact, the, the next day when Jesus goes into the temple and he, and he starts turning tables and throwing people out of the temple, throwing the money changers out. Why? Because it was, it was the scam of the Pharisees. They were, they were in on it. They were in on, on the abuse with the money changing and the overcharging and the interest. They were getting their cut. And when Jesus comes in, and, and, and they're like, whoa, whoa you're going to ruin things for us. We rule here. And they were not willing to submit, to surrender that rule to Jesus. They weren't willing to give up their little setup. And they missed God. Because they're, of their unwillingness to surrender agendas and ideas and their will. Many of us today find ourselves struggling in life because we've yet to surrender our agenda to God. Jawar, if you can come to the piano, please. Many of us today find ourselves in this endless cycle that just does not end because we, we refuse to surrender to the Lord. We refuse to give up what we feel pertains to us, belongs to me. And when we, when we behave that way with God, we're missing it. We're not willing to surrender things that we've held on to for a long time. Things that I've dreamed about. Things that I've hoped for. Maybe certain things in my flesh that just I feel I need in my life. Say, God, you don't understand. I need this. And God say, you don't need that. Some addiction. Some habit. Some relationship. Some struggle. We hold on to these things. Thinking that it's better than what God can offer us. And so Jesus weeps. I believe he weeps for us today. Pharisees were having none of that. And so they plot to kill Jesus. See, they're thinking, ah, oh, we're going we're gonna to snuff him out. What, what they don't understand is, no, no, buddy, this is the will of God. He's freely giving his life, right? They think they were slick and were able to get, get him cornered and, and crucified. And Jesus is saying, no, you're playing right into my hands. I'm forcing the issue because my time is now. The Passover lamb in the natural was being prepared for Passover. But Jesus is saying, I am the final Passover lamb that will be crucified and given for the sake of the people once and for all. So Jesus has to force the issue. Jesus is pushing all the buttons. And Jesus basically planned his own parade. Go get me the donkey. Let's go do this. Let's get that. I'm marching in. I'm going to declare myself. Like Jesus is pushing all those buttons to get the Pharisees to this place where like we got we to gotta take him out. Thinking it, it was their plan. But it was Jesus forcing their hand. And so there were consequences to their decision as I close. Jesus said, you did not recognize, you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you, that I was here and you didn't even see me. 
I was with you and you didn't even know it. And the other thing he said to him is, if you had really known what would bring you peace, if you had really known what would bring you peace, you see, he was the prince of peace. He was our peace. He was, he was all that they needed. But maybe they found peace in themselves. You know, Jerusalem means the city of peace. Maybe they were like, no, we got this. We're trusting in ourselves. God will be with us. A very religious attitude. Maybe they found peace in themselves. Maybe they found peace, temporary peace, living with the Romans. You know what? We don't like the fact that they're over us, but you know what? There's a little protection there. A little like Maybe they're putting their trust in the Romans to guard them. Ironically, the words of Jesus come true some 40 years later. In AD, uh, 70 AD, the city of Jerusalem is destroyed. Destroyed by who? By the Romans. The very people that maybe perhaps they had put their trust in or their secure, found their security in was the very same thing that came back and killed them. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to bear these two things in mind. Are we missing something? God is, God is saying it, but we're not seeing it. What expectations do you have of Jesus? What box have you prepared for him? What kind of Messiah would you like? Sometimes we treat him like a buffet, like I want a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Some of this here, some here, some there. No, nah, I don't want that. What kind of expectations do you have on the Messiah? And are you willing to surrender your agenda, your dreams, your issues, your struggles? Maybe you've rejected him today. Come on up here, singers, everyone. Come on up. Maybe you've rejected him today. Here's the good news. Maybe you've laid him aside and say, ah, later for you, Jesus. I got no time for you. Maybe you've done that. Here's the good news. There's still time. The fact that I'm here, the fact that you're here, it's not a coincidence. It's God giving you time. But if not today, here's what I'll say to you. Tomorrow is promised to no one. And this may be the opportunity that comes once. That's the risk that we all take. They missed it. But we don't have to. Can you bow your heads? Close your eyes. I know today we could have spent a lot of time just hyping up Jesus, celebrating and shouting and giving God praise. And, and that's great and that's necessary and that's important and that's nice. And listen, that's, I, I would love to be in that mode as well. But sometimes, you know, it's easy to just forget about the real issues because it's let's just throw a party. Let's just, let's just praise God. Let's focus on Jesus so that we don't have to focus on me. So today I'd like to take a few minutes to pray. Singers are going to sing something. And I want you to just ponder what you've heard today. Listen for the voice of the Spirit. What would He say to you today? What is He saying to you right now? And before we pray, just close your eyes and let's just worship the Lord.
ask you a question right here, right now. Are you good with God? Is he the Messiah or is he a Messiah of your own making? Do you recognize him? His lordship? Are you missing it? Have you surrendered? I know we're running late, so let me say this. Is there anybody here that would say, Pastor, today I want to I wanna surrender to God. I want to surrender to the Lord. And if that's you, I would love to pray with you. And I'm going to ask you that if that is you and you get out of your seat and just come forward. I'd love to pray with you. We, we have some of our pastors, some of our deacons here. Is there anybody here today that would surrender their agenda, surrender their will, receive the Lord? If Come on over here, my sister. Who else? Who else is brave enough? Stand here with me. Who else is brave enough today? Who else is honest enough today to say, God, I've missed it, and I'm still missing it? Glad they can somebody stand here with my with these people, pastors, deacons, come on up here. 
Anybody else today before we leave? Maybe your decisions have gone, have flown in the face, have flown in the face of the will of God. Today, you can change that. Can we all stand right now? We're going to sing this chorus a time or two again. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're fighting in your heart right now. Maybe your flesh is saying, don't do it, don't go. Can you push that voice to the side and say, God, I want to do your will. I want to honor you. You are Lord. You are master. You are king. You have the final say. Is there anyone bold enough, brave enough today today? To say, God, I surrender my life to you. I confess you, Jesus, as my Messiah, as my Lord, as my Savior. Anyone else here? Maybe the majority of us are probably Christian and we're in a good place. And if you're not Christian, I would say to you, hey, step out of your seat. Can we pray? Can we ask God for a turnaround? Can we ask God to do something different in your life? Can you make a U-turn? Don't miss it. Don't miss it. He's the God of the second and third and fourth and fifth chance. But we don't know when that last opportunity may show up. For tomorrow is not promised. Anybody else before we pray? Come on, singers. Let's lift up our voices. Let's honor God. Let's worship him. Everybody here, just begin to pray. Everyone just begin to pray and to worship right now. I know we're going to leave. I I need you to focus right now. Lives are at stake. Souls are at stake right now. I need you to pray. Holy Spirit, have your way in our lives. Have your way in this service. Hallelujah. God, reach. Reach those that are far. God, reach those that have rejected you. God, reach those that have turned their back on you. God, if there are any backsliders in the room, oh God, I pray that you would call them back, not to condemnation, but to be called back into the loving arms of a God that loves them. Oh Jesus, we surrender to you, Lord. Yes, we do. I want to know you more. I want to give you my life, Jesus. Anyone else, come on, step out right now. Don't let the enemy win. Don't let him talk you out of it. I know it's hard, but this is the greatest decision you will ever make. Hallelujah. Don't be afraid. We've all been there. Don't be afraid. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not trying to manipulate you, but I'm pleading. I'm pleading with you. Come on and surrender your life. Come on and surrender your life to the Lord. Have your way in my life, God. I bow before you, Jesus. Anyone else, don't miss this opportunity that I'm giving you, that the Holy Spirit is giving you. Have your way. Today, I want to pray. Pray for these that are here at the altar. And some may be at the altar for the very first time receiving Christ. So if you're here at the altar and it's your first time receiving Christ, can you repeat this prayer and pray it with me? And church, can you pray it out loud with them to encourage them? And all God asks is for you to mean this with all of your heart. Say, Jesus, 
I come to you right now. I surrender my life. And I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And I thank you for forgiving me of my sins. I confess them to you. Cleanse me and wash me and help me. I receive you today. Be the Lord of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. And God, I pray for each and every one of us today, Lord, at this altar, struggling, surrendering our agendas to you today, online, in the room. Lord, let it be about you. May we exalt you. May we praise you. May we honor you. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy towards us. And so, Father, we humble ourselves and we ask for your help. And I pray for all of us here today. And that's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together today, everyone. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Listen, if you, if you came to the altar, I would encourage you to fill out the form on your chair or the QR code is on the screen. Just put your camera out, hit the QR code, give us your information. We just want to make sure that you have what you need going forward. Maybe it's counseling. Maybe it's encouragement. Maybe it's just a phone call. Maybe it's next steps. We want to be able to help you. So go ahead and do this. Help us to help you. Okay. Thank you for coming today. Be blessed. Go in peace. Go and sin no more. Okay, I love you all. God bless you. Hug two or three people right around you. Happy Palm Sunday. We've got our Spanish service happening at 12 p.m. But have a great day, and I'll see you all. Good Friday. Good Friday. 7.30 p.m. here. Take care. Hey, and can I say, if you have your kids up uh, with Sela Kids, if you can go get them.